and greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome here to the Steve Day Show, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace. Coming up on today's show, we are going to spend an hour, next hour, talking to one of the most controversial people in America that you, many of you have probably not heard of unless you are a Theo nerd. All right. But um, he, for my money, uh, came up with the greatest name for a blog in the blogging era of all time. Uh, the name of his blog was Gog and May Blog, which again, right now, like 3% of you are bent over laughing at this and everybody else is like, what, what is that exactly? Okay. Uh, but Douglas Wilson is going to join us uh, from Moscow, Idaho coming up in the next hour of the show. What is this Moscow mood? And what is Christendom? And why is it exactly what we need for this period of time in our history? We're going to get into that and more with Douglas Wilson. After my conversion, there was a a small group of people from various theological persuasions that had a huge amount of influence on me uh, shortly after my conversion. And one guy in my sports talk radio audience at the time named Eric, this is how long ago this was, kids, all right, this was 21 years ago, um, started sending me audio cassettes of this guy's messages. And that's how I first listened to Douglas Wilson was on audio cassette. Can you even buy those nowadays? Do they sell them anywhere except antique stores? Okay. Uh, But uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking out at uh, Moscow, Idaho, which is not easy to get to, by the way. Um, but um, we had no idea. No idea. Um, I, I read this book for 75 Hard. It was the first nonfiction book I read during that regimen. Finished it about, what, a month ago? Came to you guys with uh, your own copies and said, hey, check this out, because we're going to discuss it in depth during the overtime today as well with the two of you. And um, we had no idea what would be the events of the day that we'd be talking about. I mean, it's just, I know we keep saying this, man, but it is providential that we are having this conversation with Douglas Wilson today. Yes. We, we were literally just trying to come up with a day where, where we didn't have anything else booked, you know, dog days of summer. And we're like, right, hey, that's far enough out. You know, we could, we could fit him in. We want to have this conversation and let it, let, and this is a conversation that needs to breathe and not be rushed, right? Okay. Well, I, I booked him a month ago or something yeah. like that. Yeah. We had no idea what was going to transpire and yet here we are so uh we're going to get to that coming up uh at uh it, it coming up in the second hour of the program um at the bottom of this hour i want us to discuss for idolatry or not how to avoid trump idolatry on project 2025 how to avoid this and you can pretty much fill in anything for project 2025 fair yeah. What I'm about to lay out would fill in on literally anything Donald Trump talks about and when he talks about it and how he does even. Okay. But in this case, it's, it, it, we're going to apply it to Project 2025, which I didn't even know what this was until two weeks ago. I'm still not entirely sure I know what it is. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, I, I know what's, I, I've seen a lot of people uh, tweeting things like Project 2025 will make sure that actual women are now in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue moving forward. Stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to get into that at the bottom of the hour. But before we get to, you know, official events underway. In the last nine days, we saw one presidential candidate nearly assassinated. We saw an open coup culminated against the other presidential candidate. This is at least the most tumultuous political year, and we're barely halfway through. But this is at least the most tumultuous political year in America since 1968, before any of us doing this show was born. My, my mom was just, uh, was 12. And that year he had LBJ. By the end of the summer, LBJ had announced that he's not running for re-election. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. RFK Jr. had, or R- Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated. That had happened by the time we got to August in the year 1968. 
And this is the most tumultuous year the country has had politically since then. And you could argue, given where we are culturally right now, like there was a counterculture in the 60s, but the culture war in that era was not nearly as prevalent as it is right now. I mean, it's it's house to house combat right now. You could argue that this is the most tumultuous first half of a year politically America has ever had, or at least since the Civil War. Or at the very least since 1968. Here's what that means. We have been telling you about the Jace case for the last few years. Do not put this off. You absolutely never know. I mean, they've, the president of the United States is on a 10th dose of Paxlovid, literally. From the same people that told you you couldn't have hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, which is now not a Nobel Prize winning drug, it's horse paste. Make sure you've got peace of mind. I right, get the Jace case from Jace Medical, venerable antibiotics like doxycycline, amoxicillin, and more. Uh, you can also expand it to your specific medications, practical things like EpiPens. Even mental health drugs, many of them are included in their, uh, in their, you know, like basically their menu of drugs they have available. Especially if you've got an elderly loved one right now that's on Medicare and a total ward of the state, make sure they have what they need. All right, go to jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E is where you want to go. jacemedical.com. Use the code DACE at checkout. You'll get a discount. And then you'll also sleep better tonight, knowing that's at least one thing you can check off your list. Should there be another, oh, that could never happen here, happening here. JaceMedical.com. Use the code DACE at checkout for JaceMedical.com. And with that, here is Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Shigon. Secret Service Director Kim Cheadle testified in front of a House committee yesterday regarding the failed assassination of Donald Trump. Assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump on July 13th is the most significant operational failure of the Secret Service in decades. She also declined to answer whether Thomas Matthew Crooks was working alone. It is unfathomable that a 20-year-old on the radar of Secret Service and local law enforcement before President Trump went on stage was able to climb onto the roof of a building with a rifle and fire off multiple rounds before he was neutralized. Was Mr. Crooks acting alone? Again, I would have to refer you to the FBI's investigation. Cheadle also said her agency, amazingly, doesn't have recorded radio communications from that day. Uh, does the Secret Service routinely record communications between and amongst detail? Radio communications? Any communication. Well, email communications are uh, captured as well as uh, text messages. And then depending on the detail, uh, radio communications are recorded. Does the Secret Service have recorded communications from the July 13th event? We do not have radio communications from that day. After that joke of a hearing, both Democrat Jamie Raskin along with Republican James Comer of the House Oversight Committee penned a letter calling on Secret Service Director Kim Cheadle to resign, saying her performance did nothing to help the public trust in her agency. This morning, Cheadle acquiesced and is stepping aside. We still have not seen President Joe Biden since he stepped aside in his re-election race. According to independent journalist Jordan Schachtel, writing at the dossier, he's corroborating reporting from Turning Point's Charlie Kirk that the president suffered some sort of medical emergency last week during a campaign stop in Las Vegas. Citing local anonymous law enforcement sources, they were told there was a possible medical emergency involving the 81-year-old and were instructed to clear a path to get the presidential motorcade to a local hospital quickly. Plans then changed again and the motorcade went to the airport before Air Force One took off for Delaware and made it there from Las Vegas in a blistering three hours and 48 minutes. The Biden campaign, of course, then reported his trip was cut short after a COVID diagnosis, but obviously more is afoot. Yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu arrived in the U.S. for a meeting with the president, which was canceled, as well as an address in front of the Senate. Neither Joe Biden, obviously, nor Kamala Harris was at the airport to greet Netanyahu, and Harris will not preside over the Senate during the Prime Minister's address for some reason. Like I said, we still have not seen Joe Biden in almost a week, but he did call in, apparently, to the Harris campaign headquarters, which is in Delaware. Does he sound OK? We've got a great, great, I think we made the right decision. I know how hard you've worked, how many sacrifices you've made. And so many of you, so many of you uprooted your lives for me and the kind of commitment few people make for anything these days. But you made it. 
And I've been Harris honored. also spoke to this group as well. It is so good to hear our president's voice. Joe, I know you're still on the on the call. And Say what? It is so good to hear our president's voice. Joe, I know you're still on the on the call. This absolutely stinks. Kamala Harris now has enough pledged delegates to secure the nomination at the DNC next month. Switching gears, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention announced Monday night, just last night, that President Brent Leatherwood has been removed from his position. He had served as president of the SBC's public policy entity since September of 2022. Then this morning, the ERLC issued a statement retracting their statement, announcing the removal of Leatherwood, stating procedures for doing so were not followed correctly. According to Megan Basham at the Daily Wire, the media blowback from CNN, the New York Times, and other secular left media orchestrated by Russell Moore, former ERLC president, is what caused the ERLC to retract its dismissal of Brent Leatherwood. Basham is citing sources within the ERLC. William Wolf of the Center for Baptist Leadership stated this morning on X, the removal of Leatherwood was actually a good thing for the SBC, but leadership within that public policy arm is dreadful. What a mess. The Daily Wire's Jordan Peterson interviewed Elon Musk this week, and the latter revealed why he's committed his life to eradicating what he calls the woke mind virus. I was, um, I was essentially tricked into uh, signing documents uh, for one of my older boys, Xavier. Uh, this is before I had really any understanding of what was going on, and we had COVID going on, and so uh, there was a lot of confusion. Um, and um, you know, I was told, oh, he, you know, Xavier might commit suicide if if he. That was a that was a lie right from the outset. Incredibly evil, and I agree with you that the people that have been promoting this should go to prison. That's so I was I was tricked into doing this, um, and. Uh, you know, it wasn't explained to me that puberty blockers are actually just sterilization drugs. Um, so, um, anyway, uh, and so I lost my son, essentially. Uh, so, you know, they, uh, they call it dead naming for a reason. Yeah, I... All right, I'm, so they, the reason it's called dead naming is because uh, your son is dead. So my son Xavier is dead. Killed by the woke mind virus. So I vowed to destroy the, mind, the woke mind virus after that. And we're making some progress. That's absolutely heart wrenching. In completely unrelated news, Mr. Beast is the most popular YouTuber in the world. You may have seen in recent years headlines about one of his co-hosts, Chris Tyson, who left his wife and children to pursue his perverted fetish of pretending to be a woman. In the most unsurprising news of all time, Chris Tyson, who now goes by the name Ava, is accused of grooming a 13-year-old when he himself was 20 years old. Tyson has deleted all of his posts on X after these allegations came out. Oh, and that's what happened while we were away. Slow news day. The level of evil in, in that. It's just overwhelming. And. As a dad, I'm just, I've seen that clip like six times, but every time I see it, I just. I don't. Wow. Similar to what I've said about Trump in the last week and a half. Really wish the church in America was as resolved to take on the spirit of the age as Elon Musk is. I mean, Elon Musk is a powerful weapon. Lots of money, right? Mm -hmm. Richest man in the world. He could certainly do an extraordinary amount of damage against the spirit of the age, and he has. Yes. Just with what's happened with Twitter. But, man, imagine if the only transcendent institution God ever formed on the face of the earth had that level of resolve, what, what it could do to the spirit of the age. Have you thought about that? More than whatever's going on at the SBC, apparently. I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention's an unmitigated disaster. I mean, it's just an unmitigated disaster. Just an unmitigated disaster.
And it's one of the reasons why, going back to the conversation we had with Jeff Myers yesterday, you're seeing the next generation of believers are largely going into two very divergent camps, neither one of them Southern Baptist. And they're going into charismatic camps or reform camps. And we'll be talking to one of the leaders in that camp, Douglas Wilson, coming up in the next hour of the show. But... Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about what has been the most pivotal, influential denomination in evangelicalism at post-World War II. It, it's just an unmitigated disaster. It's a, it's a toilet circling there. That is un, I'm sure the individual church is unmitigated. There's thousands of them. I'm sure thousands of them are great. But it's about the head, okay? I mean, the creation runs on headship, and the headship of that denomination is just an unmitigated disaster. Toilet circling disaster. I know a lot of people feel that way about what's happened on the pro-life side since we supposedly got our biggest win ever and then lost all our momentum after that. You see, there's a, there's a reoccurring theme here, lack of leadership and what that, what that does overall. You know, it's almost like we're sheep that need shepherds, right? Almost like that. Yeah. When there's a lack of leadership, when you have whitewashed tombs, when you have stiff necked leaders, when you have cowards who are listed first among those who will be thrown in the lake of fire with the with the beast, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet for all of eternity. When you when your leaders are too often made up of things like that, you end up with a culture that looks a lot like this. And if you're one of those believers who is tis tisking Donald Trump every time he doesn't tell the truth, which he does too often, and you're tisk tisking when Elon Musk says we're to let porn happen on Twitter, which he shouldn't do, right? Okay. But if you're wondering why those two people have great big followings way larger at this point in time than most American pastors and Christian leaders do, it's because they're actually doing something about the spirit of the age, despite their fallacies and weaknesses. I mean... I won't put them on because I don't need, I don't need a, an atheist to explain the, the enemy to me. But the reality is James Lindsay is one of the smartest people in the entire right American right. And he can't even get the first basic fact of human existence right that there is a God. Stop and think about that. One of the most, one of the most analytically honest about the enemy we're up against is a guy who doesn't even accept the most basic fact of the universe, which in any other era would make him a moron. But because of what's happened in our era, he's a prophet, right? Sure. That's where we are. That's why we need organizations like Preborn. They are doing something about what is happening uh, with the institutionalized child sacrifice that too many Republicans can't be bothered by and too many churches are ashamed to address, which is why the killing has continued for all these years. They are stopping it as best they can, but they need funding from people like us. If you want to make a tax deductible donation today to help them reach a mom before she murders her child. Go to preborn.com slash Steve. Make that donation today. Preborn.com slash Steve. Give them the money that you were going to waste on the Republican Party. Give it to them. Preborn, and at this, in this case, this is actually tax deductible as a double benefit. It's not on the other case. Preborn.com slash Steve or dial pound 250. Say the keyword baby on your mobile phone. How bad does it have to be? I mean, we have said here the last few years and like no one's been held accountable. Michael Avenatti eventually went to prison, but it wasn't for bringing us Julie Swetnick, who just sat there and lied about Brett Kavanaugh. It was for stuff that happened even before he became, uh, he was mm -hmm. made a household name by the very same spirit of the age, right? Yeah. So no one's truly held accountable for like anything these days, it seems. Nothing. You can commit coups, you can commit character assassinations, you can do whatever you want. All right, you can just you can just write blank checks to to uh, Ukraine's borders that you don't spend defending and protecting our own. We've done all those shows, and no one is held accountable. So how bad must it be that the secret that the Secret Service director, especially given that she's a woman with DEI protection, how mad must it be that she is re she has resigned in the last hour and a half? How bad must it be? I want to show you how bad it is. I want you to look at these. These are facts. What I'm about to show you are all facts. Just to recap on the plot to assassinate Donald Trump. And why do I say a plot? I'll explain here as we go through this. No radio recordings from Secret Service at all. They don't have any. Nothing. The math club shooter, as I've dubbed him, flew a drone over a secure airspace on the day of the shooting. Folks, we, we shut down large sporting events for that. 
Now, some may say, well, maybe it was very early in the morning. Dude, 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 dude how early in the morning do you think it's okay to fly a, a, an unknown drone over a secure airspace? How, when, when, how, how early do you think is too early, do you think? How about never? How about that's not like permitted at all? Thoughts on that? Like Seems 24 hours before or after, you don't get to do stuff like that. Or 48 hours. How about a month before or after, maybe? Like never? You never get to do that. The math club shooter was seen shimmying up a wall with a rifle. <clears throat> the math club shooter was able to negotiate the, quote, sloped roof that was deemed too dangerous for trained law enforcement and security. Trump was denied extra security. <clears throat> Somehow the math club shooter was able to get a clean light of sight less than 150 yards away. But a police sniper was able to take him out after he fired, of course, from over 400 yards away, meaning they had some form of a secured perimeter. They did. <clears throat> they, had a, a, they had someone watching that, those rooftops from over 400 yards away, and yet somehow this math club kid still got to this roof. A congressman produces a video that shows just how easy it is uh, that shot was. There's no excuse for how that guy got to that, that level of perch. Um, the, uh, the math club shooter had an FBI, had a phone that the FBI struggled to unlock, was apparently the only Gen Z male in America with a little social media profile. And nine days later, nine days later, nine days later, we still do not know the key details about his life or motives. Here's my conclusion. Once and for all, take your stupid smart set talking point about don't attribute malice where incompetence is the answer. Shove that right up your Pete Buttigieg dedicated sphincter hole once and for always right up there till it comes right out the other damn end. Shove it right up there. You're not smarter than the rest of us. You're a moron. You're a fool. You're in the nothing good comes from Nazareth camp. Too good to see something when it's right in front of you. Then maybe if you do that, that experience will humble you enough to see the signs of the times. This is absolutely a plot. I don't have enough faith in this many random coincidences to believe this is a coincidence. It absolutely is. And they're not even attempting as our editor, Matt Peter, Matthew Peterson, uh, put it posted on X this morning when I, in response to this post, actually, millions of Americans are thinking this and the so-called adults in the room are doing nothing whatsoever to convince you otherwise. We've gone from cockamamie, cockamamie narratives. Well, we've now got a bunch of studies that instantly show mask work. We just can't show them to you. They're not even doing that now. Not even doing that now. <clears throat> right out in the open. And right out in the open, they tried to kill him. The problem is that, they, that this is a different era than when, when they did this to JFK. It's a different era. We have social media now. And there's at least one site, the aforementioned one owned by Elon Musk, where muckraking is still encouraged, like what you saw Charlie Kirk and Jordan Schachtel doing in Aaron's montage on where is the president of the United States? We're going on day six now, halfway through day six, still haven't seen the president in six days, as of now. They don't have a Warren commission. Mike Johnson just appointed a bipartisan commission. How optimistic are you guys about that? Thoughts? Negative energy. A, a, a negative ghostwriter. Let's just move on. But it's too late now. The narrative is out now. They, 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 can't, they, can't, they can't let you know, lock the barn door after the horse is left. And the lone gunman with Maggie's drawers missed. And so that's what's transpiring right now. <clears throat> they know this, which is why they're not even attempting a counter narrative. If anything, Mike Johnson and his committee will help them craft their counter narrative down the line, if anything. That is way more likely than that committee is going to come back with the truth of what happened here. Way more likely. Agree or disagree? If anything I've said thus far, either one of you. Agree. Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go back to what I said last week as well. <clears throat> Even, let, let's just, let's pretend... Let's pretend this is all just coincidence, 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 coincidence. Even if that's true, 
These things just kind of tend to happen in late stage republics. No matter, even if you're, even if you're, what I'm saying is, even if you come down with the explanation that don't attribute to uh, malice what can be attributed to incompetence, that's not a great answer. That's the freaking secret service, guys. There are no good answers here. And there hasn't been a benign, innocent one from five minutes after it happened. There are no good answers. No matter if you come down on the side of just a bunch of coincidences, that's not a great thing either. I, have, I, I don't have any idea how you could possibly come down on the side of these are coincidences. I mean, I, 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 in all honesty, I think the only way you can come down on the side that these are coincidences are, A, you just refuse. You, are stu- you stubbornly refuse to see the signs of the times. B, you're disappointed that they missed. Or C, you just have let Donald Trump break your brain that you just can't possibly fathom and accept this. I've already addressed group A. I can't do anything about group B. That's Holy Spirit territory. So let me talk to group C for a minute. Steve, what happened to you? I'm doing the same thing I did March 16, 2020. That you all cheered. I'm doing the same thing. Same thing. Because we're up against the exact same forces. I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing the same kind of work that led to people like Ron DeSantis to switch the decisions they were making and go against the spirit of the age when originally almost everybody, except for this show and just a a very small pocket of people, were all in on the official narrative. I'm doing the same thing. This doesn't add up. And Todd, do you know why it doesn't add up? Because it doesn't? Yeah, you know why it doesn't make any sense, Todd? Because it doesn't? Because it doesn't make any sense. This is just not possible. It is just absolutely not possible, this many coincidences. It's just not. Burden of proof is not on me if you don't believe that. It's on you. You continue. If you can't see this at this point, I don't know what to tell you. Other than it's very clear, even though throughout too many moments in his presidency, he did not live up to the billing that both he and others who both are for and against him had of him. But the mere idea that the people he represents may come to power, even in limited capacities, may be encouraged in limited capacities. For example, Ron DeSantis is never governor of Florida if Donald Trump doesn't become president. Never happens in a million years. Never happens. It's the threat of who he represents, of what that, that indicates what, what they are willing to do to this guy. Because what it is perceived he represents. It's not always a light I understand. It's not always a light I get. It's not always a light that I'm like, that's my light, okay? But it is, and at it, and times it's more strobe than lighthouse. Fair? Yes. Okay. But it's light. And even that little modicum of light in this darkness, the the darkness cannot tolerate it. And he is catching strays that should be coming to us. But we've got other things to do. Pontifications. Lint in navels to ponder. Signs of the times to ignore. Coincidences to defend. We need to make sure everyone knows we're not like those other people that believe those things. We're the smart Christians. We're the smart set. We're better. We're team sanity. We need to do that. Hope they don't fire on you next. This is wicked in the extreme. And it's overtly and flat out demonic. And it's so obvious that there's no other possible explanation. Which is why those who want to remain unwilling to see what is currently happening. And I get it. For a long time, I didn't even truly understand the fullness of this until they started shooting at him. 
But now that they're shooting at him, I kind of feel like we're kind of out of excuses not to see what's really going on. Fair? Sure. Fair. You know, there are those who lead, and we were just talking about the dearth of leaders we have in our culture right now, systematically, unfortunately, and then there are those who follow. And if you are heading into the Let's Go Brandon real estate market during these unprecedented times. Bing, 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 bing. Indeed, all the banks. Uh, make sure you are following a real estate agent that you can trust and you're going to find them where the name says it all. Head over to realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, that's realestateagentsitrust.com and there we'll hook you up with an agent whose track record we've looked at, we've verified, we've validated. We're not just going to give you anybody. And a lot of times these are agents that are from right here in the audience. So uh, you share a similar value system with them in common as well. Feel free to speak freely in those cases. And so whether it is somewhere across town, across state, or across the country, you'll, you'll, they'll lead you to where you want to go, get you the end result that you need to have, especially in one of the most difficult real estate markets in American history. Never before have you needed one of these. A real estate agent you can trust. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, head over to realestateagentsitrust.com. All right. I want to do a very brief idolatry or not here. Uh, before we turn it over to uh, Douglas Wilson next hour, and uh, and we discuss mere Christendom, and you know these are the kinds of conversations we had to have a lot from 2017 to 2000. Well, from January of 2017 until March of 2020, we had these kinds of conversations all the time. Okay. Yes. Um, and we were often very frustrated and flummoxed while having these conversations, were we not? Yes. Yes. They would also be preferable to the conversations we are currently having and just had to have, correct? Sure. Yes. Okay. So um, so look at this almost like a remedial class. You know, it's summertime. School starts in a couple of weeks, you know, the first day or two of school, maybe in some places the first week is kind of... You took the summer off, you worked, you played sports, you hung out with your friends, you get, you know, you got to get caught up on where you left things off when you guys left school, right? Okay. Yes. So um, he, we need to, a reminder, I think, of what life is like when Donald Trump is your standard bearer and or president of the United States, because right now he is the standard bearer and right now the odds are very high he'll be the next president of the United States. It's no guarantee. Like I said to Jesse Kelly yesterday on his show, do not underestimate Kamala Harris. All right. This woman let a lot of men get on top of her to get where she is at. She is now on top of all of them. Okay. So don't underestimate her. That being said, she also has a very obvious ceiling of talent beyond her just sheer shameless guile. Right. So I would expect to beat her if it is her. Still not entirely convinced of that, but I would expect to beat her, but don't underestimate her. Okay. That all being said, you know, there's a reason why right now in the betting markets, Trump is like at 66% to win the presidency, highest he's ever been. So this is, we, I think we need a crash course on this. Fair? Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you're, if you don't, if we don't get this, and, and I know from experience, I, early on in the Trump era, I almost fell into one of these camps. I had to figure this out for my own. Okay. Um. Donald Trump doesn't always tell you the truth. Breaking. Yeah. I mean, is this news? Is this now? Is it because um, he is being intentionally dishonest to his own base? Is it because um, he is being dishonest in a Rahabian way, like to people that are out to get him, right? Okay, and you know, no, I, I'm not hiding any. Uh, I'm 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 not hiding any Semite spies here, at, at my you know at my uh, Hooker Love Palace here in uh, the land of Canaan. I know not what you're talking of. Okay, is it because of that? Answers to both of those. Is it to cover up his own shame? Of, of, of things he's done that are, that he's now being, you know, called on the carpet for? Is it because he throws up trial balloons to see what people are really going to say if he does these things? The answer to those questions is what, men? Who knows? Yes. Well, that too. <laughs> that too. Yeah. It, it, the answer is yes, and who knows? 
And it, it can be yes to all and, and then none, yes to some and then some others, none and then some others, plus and then yes to all. I mean, that's just, you know, as I, I, I was speaking to somebody who's clo- very close to Trump last week during the convention, and this person said to me, Donald Trump can be complicated. Fair. That's Yesterday, a, today, and tomorrow. He's yes, just, yes. That, it's, it's the same weather it's always been. That is very true. Okay. And so I, I, I want to take the moment of this Project 2025 to re-illustrate this. Consider this now today, July 23rd. Assuming if he survives, literally, not even a joke, assuming if he survives, it is likely that we're going to get a crash course in what life with Donald Trump at the top is like for another four years. All right? And that everybody comes with nuances. Everybody comes with idiosyncrasies. Everybody comes with their own baggage. That would be true if you, if any of us were in his position. None of us are with, none of us are without sin. None of us tiptoe between the raindrops here. Fair? Okay? All right? Um, Except for Kamala. She's great and has never done anything That wrong. is true. As the police one saying, it's a big enough umbrella, but it always ends up me that's getting wet. Okay? None of us tiptoe between the raindrops here. All right? So... You just have to know what baggage your guy is coming to the table with. And with Donald Trump, it's if, if you react to everything he says, I'm just going to tell you right now. You're going to lose your damn mind. And, and, and honestly, not even a, a slight exaggeration, maybe your soul in the process, because we have seen some people whose just brains are busted and it's at a soul now level you know, where Jonah Goldberg is writing, you know, books about the demo- and columns about the demonic left when you and I are coming of age politically. And, you know, and now he's made a career. His new career is he's a professional. I can't even her. That, that's essentially his career, right? Yes. He was he went from culture warrior to I can't even her. He let Donald Trump literally mm-hmm. just bust his brain at down to the soul level. Right. He actually wrote a book called liberal fascism. And now yes. it's like. And he can't. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Psych. <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, you know, those royalty checks cashed. Exactly. Okay. So if you do this, you're going to put yourself in a position where you, if, if you defend everything he says all the time, you're going to look to your friends and family that you might be able to win over, particularly in this desperate moment to voting for him, you're going to look like a fool. Because if you defend everything, you're going to make everything look like 4D chess, and, and, that, and it's not. It's, it's not. And they're going to look at you like, yeah, you're not, ser- you're not a serious person. And that's, that's been one of the self-inflicted limiting principles of him and his movement is that factor. It, mm. does, it turns a lot of people off, right? Yeah. Okay. Particularly people where all three of us live in suburbs and exurbs of, of America that determine elections. It turns a lot of them off because they view themselves as the, uh, as the people that are above such things. And so they are immediately like, mm. I moved out to the suburbs to be away from members of my family who behave like this, so I don't want any part of it, right? That, I'm not, that's basically what's going on here. Fair? Yeah, but those people in mass are ultimately what opened the door to this cycle. Correct. Cycle after cycle after Correct, yes. correct. But they also would not be the first people eager to not repent of their own role in a mess. That's also true, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if repentance was something we were all eager to do, we wouldn't have to be commanded to do it, okay? Um, or you'll end up being the kind of person that, seem, that, that nothing good can happen. Nothing good can be done. Um, and everything that he touches is bad. Um, you'll, I mean... I, For example, um, he took the pro-life planks out of the platform. That's the most important issue. I'm out. I mean, he's 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 watering down our party. Valid criticisms, all right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, does does he not get then get credit for appointing the justices that overturned Roe and made the toughest abortion laws in America in places like Iowa and Florida and Georgia possible in the first place? My point being is that's very complicated moral math, is it not? Well, it's certainly more complicated than a lot are uh, yes. letting it up to be right now. And and I'm you're just dealing with someone that is not as cut and dried on many things as many of us would would want. And you just have to come to grips with that. Just like if I were your standard bearer, I'd probably be too cut and dried. And you'd be like, hey, you know. Can we maybe not just tell them right to their faces? We're just going to put them all in prison and shut their departments down because we're getting we're getting shot out out here. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I mean, everybody comes with their own baggage, 
And then you have to determine whether that baggage is too much for you to accept or not. And I respect your decision on that. I'm, I'm more concerned about not letting this era bust more people's brains down to the soul level if we can avoid it. His baggage is way more predictable than, look at this, how you let off talking Correct. Michelle. I mean, his, po his he is a politician, is basically him in New York. A lot of success, built a lot of stuff, a lot of bankruptcies, screwed a lot of things up. Isn't that him politically as Pretty well? Pretty much. High highs and low yes. lows. It's not, it's not, he's not a known quantity, exactly. He's 78 years old. He's one of the most famous people in, in modern human history. And he was one of the most famous people on the planet before he became president. Who can we say that about, like, ever? Okay. So Project 2025, I didn't know what this was. It's a project of people like Heritage Foundation and others. Kind of like, you know, Ron, Donald Trump has, similar to Ron Paul, uh, lots of insurgent movements have people who want to turn it into a cottage industry and people who believe in the, in, uh, you know, the actual ideas that it represents. Ron Paul had the same thing. He had, a co he had cottage industry people. Some of them ended up going to prison, actually. Um, and, and, but then you had hard movement people that really believed in his message. And, and there were dueling movements be between, behind him. You have something similar with Trump. You have people who just want to turn you know, promoting Trump into a cottage industry or opposing him into a cottage industry. Okay. Um, because the algorithms on all of all the social media like it when you're either a trump humper or a trump hater okay they, they promote you either way if you're in any one of those extreme flanks that's a great way to get algorithmic favor okay um but there are also serious people you know stephen miller um center for renewing america that's where our, our old friend and our, our old colleague rachel uh semmel Okay, who's married now, so that's not her last name anymore, but that's where she works, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, the, you know, serious movement people who really want to disrupt the system and have serious laid out ideas of how to do this, they laid, they all got together and laid out a plan called Project 2025 of what that's going to look like. And frankly, if we were to read the PDF, we'd all on this show agree with probably 96.5% of it, if not more. Mm -hmm. Fair? All right. Well, this, of course, gave the, and the left a target to shoot at, okay, to rally their base. And Trump's like, that's not me. Don't know what you're talking about. Don't know what you're talking about. And over and over again, I'm, he's betraying his base again. He's betray he might be betraying his base again. We've, we've seen him do that. I mean, we sat here, his, his, we, his base sat here all of 2020 and said, stop listening to these people and firing them instead, right? How many, we yes. all did those shows, right? Okay, so we have seen him turn on his base before, right? Okay, yes. so that could be happening. It, what could also be happening is what, what just happened an hour ago. So Trump upset a lot of economic conservatives and a lot of populists by, by previously hinting that he would be in favor of just putting absolute swamp creatures in charge of the Fed and the Treasury. He was just asked about that again. He's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I'm not even considered that. No idea. Same exact thing. Okay. Why? Same reason. My guess is. But this time, the he came from different places. He came from some of his own people. And they're like, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, what? No, what? No, what? What? I, I, I mean, I, so Nikki Haley's the nominee then? That's what we're doing here? Okay, and there was enough of that heat that Trump all of a sudden is like, wrecked him, barely knew him. Never met, met Jamie Dimon. I mean, here's photos of me and him together, but I have no clue who this guy is. All right? You have to understand this. You know, the Lord told us that faith without works is dead, correct? That it is fruit on the tree, not necessarily what people say, right? Okay? This is extremely true with Donald Trump. You have to look at what he does. And this is where I do agree with my friend and colleague Daniel Horowitz. When it is obvious he is throwing this, this stuff up as trial balloons, like on the Fed and the Treasury stuff, we on the right have to shoot them down and aggressively because he'll, he'll feel that and mm -hmm. back down, Okay. On the other hand, I think in exchange, we maybe have to give him some grace when he says to the media, I don't even know what a Project 2025 is. In fact, what is 2025? Is that next year? I don't even know. I can't even add that high. I mean, we have to maybe also give him some grace that perhaps he's Rahabian uh, lying here, just lying to the flat out uh, enemies of, uh, of uh, the enemies of light because they're undeserving of truth, basically. Now, it could turn out when he becomes president, if he does, that he actually does disavow Project 2025. And in that case, we need to scream and howl on the right like we did over Jamie Dimon and these other people. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. But folks, again, if, if you are going to go, if you're going to react to every dot and tittle of what Donald Trump says, you aren't going to survive.
You are, you, you know what? Do this. You've got better odds taking 10 doses of Paxlovid and a seventh booster. All right. Your odds are higher of survival doing that. Okay. You're, you're going to, you're just not going to last. You're just not going to last. Some, everything, everything in a fallen world comes with a sunk cost. Doesn't mean you have to like it. Okay. But a sunk cost means something that you just, it's unavoidable. You, you can't control. It is what it is. You're, you're accepting that limiting principle upon agreement. And, of, and everything in life comes with this because we're all sinners. Everybody has their own sunk cost. Okay. Somebody's always wiser. Somebody's always more honest. Somebody's always more strategic, better, more athletic, prettier, handsomer, thinner, fatter. Someone's always something or more. Everybody's a sunk cost because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you will sink yourself if you do not recognize this. Todd, your thoughts. I will sum that up my own way. Listen, we really tried, not just for multiple cycles and the ones that had nothing to do with Trump. And Aaron and I weren't here. Steve really tried to have an alternative to the federal government basically resembling the New York of the 70s and 80s and 90s that Trump came up with. But that's the alternative now Trump provides us with. It's a place I can go visit. Okay? The alternative is Gotham and the Joker and Bane and Scarecrow are running the place, okay? I'm, again, I was holding off as long as I could. I'm in the place now. I'm going with the New York of the 70s and 80s and 90s for the time being. And I do it without apology. You can disagree with the rationale necessarily or the calculus or calculations, I should say, uh, that, that I made that I, I think we were living in a completely different world if that bullet went one inch to the right. We can do that in charity, though. We can disagree about that, but that's what we're disagreeing about. And so that informs the rest of my decision that this is the last chopper out of Nam, that kind of thing. You may disagree with how I came to that conclusion, uh, but that's, that's where I'm at. And it's tough for me. I'll just say this personally. Like, I'm trying to hash out, you know, this was the calculus that I was doing before, um, before July 13th, that he's saying all these things, publicly distancing himself from Project 2025. I'm not totally sure, and I'm still not totally sure that this is the vessel that will necessarily, that the last chopper out of Nam didn't win that conflict, didn't end that conflict. It was just an escape. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I view it. Mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure if it's going to work. It might be a little uh, dingy, <laughs> but it's not bullets flying. Yep. Or at least that's the chance that I'm given. May not take you to a better place, but you know Saigon has fallen. You got to get the hell out of yep. there. Yep. Hour two is next. All right, we're back with hour two here, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace, alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. And you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Steve at SteveDace.com is where you can go for that. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook, Me, We, and Gab. You can follow us at Steve Day Show on uh, X or Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. We're still working out bugs with a live stream. It's up and working now. So if you have access to Twitter, you want to watch us live or X now, that's what it's called. You can watch us there. Thanks to those of you, I mean, many, I mean, thousands of you have been watching us uh, all throughout this very first week of this experiment. We're kind of the network guinea pig here. They're going to use us to iron out, uh, you know, the, uh, the wrinkles. And then eventually I think you'll see more of our shows live on X uh, here on The Blaze uh, as well. So uh, thank you guys for joining us there. Thanks to all of you that have also sent us five-star reviews. We appreciate each and every one of those. I'm told they do something positive for the show. Since I'm 50 now, I don't understand what that is. But I do know that they do something positive for my ego. So I really appreciate that each and every single time. You can leave your five-star review. We're close to 10,000 of those on iTunes. You can also hit subscribe or follow if you're on iTunes. And that way, every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed absolutely every single time. And we thank all of you that have done that for us too. Uh, I know in particular, the overlords here 
here at The Blaze. Appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. And since we are pleased when they are pleased, that would also please us. This part of the show brought to you by our friends over at Hillsdale College. I know we're all deeply concerned about the rot gut emanating from our universities these days, which are central hubs for the spirit of the age infestation that is rotting away the cancer that is metastasizing in American culture as we speak. There are still remnants of folks that are still on mission, still on the narrow road. One of them, our friends over at Hillsdale, they've got a great video out for Liberty Month, Independence Day month here in July. It's a portrayal of Thomas Jefferson as he reflects on the meaning of the Declaration of Independence in a letter that he wrote later in his life. You can watch that, get a free commemorative copy of the Declaration as well, which I think is absolutely one of the finest treatises written in all of human history post-canon. It's a masterpiece in my view. That's why we have it hanging in our home. All right, go to Dace for Hillsdale. That's F-O-R. That's daceforhillsdale.com to watch this inspiring video. Get that commemorative free copy of your Declaration of Independence. Visit daceforhillsdale.com. Again, daceforhillsdale.com. Some of the other places that you see out there that are trying to stay on a narrow road and lead a path out of the darkness provided uh, by the spirit of the age. For example, St. Andrew's College, which is located out in Moscow, Idaho. I spoke out there a few years ago uh, with my buddy Gabe Wrench and had a chance to meet the gentleman that's going to be with us here this hour, uh, Douglas Wilson. In fact, Doug and I are going to speak at the same event coming up later this year in Dallas, actually. It's called Prodigal America. Prodigal America is the name of the event. If you want to get more information, you can go to prodigalamerica.com. That's prodigalamerica.com. We want to welcome Doug to the show. It's been a few years, Doug, since we've had you on the program. Brother, how are you? Doing well. Uh, Good to be with you. I got to ask, do you still have the greatest blog name of all time? Uh, (laughs) Blog and May blog, or has that gone the way of uh, yesteryear? No, it's still the it's still named that, and I I think I still like it. I still think th- only three percent of the people that are watching or listening right now understand why that is funny. But rest assured, they're all laughing hard, and the other ninety seven percent have no idea what in the Sam Hill you and I are talking about. Okay, but right. it is right. a narrow road after all, Doug, as you well know. Yes, that's right. It's always it's always a narrow road. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> you wrote a book. Um, last year that I just now had a chance to read after a lot of people recommended it to me. Uh, And it's called Mere Christendom. And I wanted to spend this hour talking with you about it. When we originally scheduled this, it was many, many moons ago, not knowing what was going to be happening in the world, that we're going to be living through an era where in the span of nine days, we saw one presidential candidate nearly assassinated and out in the open, and the other presidential candidate um, face a, cul- a coup that culminated right out, right out in the open at the exact same time. So these are some crazy days. So yeah. um, I want to start... Slow, slow, news, slow news week, so we might as well fill it up with <laughs> yes. a guy from Idaho. <laughs> yes, but, but, but this <laughs> what is... Are we gonna talk, what this, are we going to talk about? This is actually the perfect time, I think, to have this more broad intellectual conversation, because... The, the, what we're, you know, we're, I was saying this just, let, let's start here, Doug, before we even get into the book. Let's have like a, maybe a, a, a prologue here so that we kind of see we agree on, on the energy and, the, and, and on the ground on the right. What's happened in the Trump era, and there's many benefits of this in my view, but there are always trade offs to any human endeavor, as you well know. Okay. What, what's happened in the Trump era is we have become more instinctive and less intellectual on the right. Okay, now I would argue prior to Trump, we were so intellectual, we had we were not instinctive and largely ineffective, uh, wholly. Okay, Um, you know we were naval lint and the naval ponderers. Basically, nobody was doing anything. Even we were so bad at it. I think Luther wanted to put the Book of James back in the New Testament. That's how bad we were at doing (laughs) stuff. Okay, so with that being said, though, I think now the pendulum has swung a very too far the other way now. Where everything is instinctive, everything's a reaction, everything's an a, is a is a is a feeling, as opposed to what's the plan here? And plans are for cucks, don't you know? In this era, okay. And so right. I want to. I think we desperately need to see if we can maybe move this thing somewhere into balance on the right in America. And I think that's going to have to come from elements of the church because they're really the cornerstone fulcrum of any culture that they're planted in. Do you agree or disagree with the diagnosis I've laid out so far? I agree with it completely, um, and I would just point out that lynch mobs 
frequently get the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't approve of their methods, okay? Right. Meaning that right. their, their instincts are biblical, if not their methodology. Is that what you're saying, right. basically? And, yes. and, the, and the problem is the, the aftermath when it goes off the rails. Right. right. Um, so, so basically, as a pastor, I've, I've frequently said uh, to people encouragingly, remember, there's no problem so bad, but that you can't make it worse. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I basically I'm greatly heartened and on the side of the the deplorables rising up. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I I understand their grievances. I they've been poked with a, a stick for so long that they finally gotten exasperated. Not only here but in Europe, and there there are many many signs of this. But anybody who thinks that populist up uprisings can't go sour or can't go wrong has never uh, heard of France. Yeah, has, has never heard of never never read a history book. Mm -hmm. So what what we have to do is. Um, harness basically enjoy that energy but we can only enjoy that energy if it is harnessed and it's got to be harnessed to the word of god ultimately amen okay so with that prologue let's dig into the book mere christendom let, let i always like to start with you know making sure our terms are defined so define right. for our audience what christendom is okay so christendom uh the first christendom was Basically, from the from the time that Constantine made the Christian faith legal, and then Theodosius uh, later made it the religion of the empire, I would say that first Christendom lasted in form, at least, down to the First World War. Uh, the, the First World War kind of wrecked it. Um, Darwin hollowed it out. Uh, so in the 1800s, there was a lot of intellectual apostasy and erosion of faith and Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach and, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the First World War sort of shattered the externals of Christendom. But that Christendom was a loose collection of nations in the West that were bound together by their shared allegiance to Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, basically, the, these nations were united in their collective confession that Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead. All right, that was, now, some of it was hypocritical, some of it was nominal, some of it was conflicted, some of it was genuine and in sincere. In other words, they were know. human beings. Yes. In other words, yeah, welcome to Earth, kid. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so that was the first Christendom, the enlightened, the and these things are like a relay race where sometimes the next movement can start before the previous one ends. Mm -hmm. The two runners are running at the same time, so the enlightenment be, uh, began the process of the great the great apostasy from um, from that Christian heritage and introduced the ideal of secularism uh, in our public discourse and uh i would i would want to argue in other words that, that cultures and institutions could be inherently godless basically okay that, that's right god right. and that godlessness is a virtue mm -hmm. it's a feature not a bug mm -hmm. uh, we can we can um, organize ourselves and live decent uh, decent lives without reference to God. In fact, when we try to live, live our lives without reference to God, that eliminates religious conflict. No longer will we have a 30 years war or Protestants and Catholics fighting or, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, the Enlightenment arose, led us into secularism out of the religious wars, Egypt, and led us across the Red Sea and into this secularist paradise. Mm -hmm. And that has that has been the sort of the narrative that the Enlightenment guys have wanted us to adopt. Now, that Enlightenment uh, ideal has only been commonly accepted in the United States in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, prior to that, overwhelmingly, we would have considered ourselves a Christian nation. Or what's often called the post-war consensus. Is that kind of what you're alluding to here? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. The post-war consensus, basically the Earl Warren court began inserting secularist assumptions into, into the public schools and into different 
avenues till we've gotten to the place where Christians no longer n- understand the Christian heritage of the United States. And uh, and they think, well, we've always been secular or uh, routinely in comment threads online. Uh, people will pop in and say the founders were deists. Look it up. Read a book. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I have looked it up and I have read a book and you don't know what you're talking about. Um or, I, or I've, I've observed, Doug, that Puritan is now a put down. Even in believer circles, we call each other Puritans as a pejorative when really without the Puritans, there's never in America. They basically founded the place. That, that, that's right. And the thing that's interesting is um, at the constant, the many interesting things at the Constitutional Convention, uh, there were 55 men there. And I'll note with a point of personal pride, all men. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, there was no no DEI representation at the Constitutional Convention. Out of those 55 men, 50 of them were Orthodox Trinitarian Christians. 50 of the 55. Now, when you look, when you point to the founders and say, weren't there deists? Well, there were a couple of deists, um, Jefferson and Franklin. And then Thomas Paine was not strictly speaking a founder. He was sort of a free spirit also. Um, but even... Even Jefferson and Franklin, as deists, were very bad deists. They uh, they believed that God uh, providentially over, oversaw human affairs. They believed that God intervened in human <clears throat> affairs, which was not the deist position. Which is a um, kid for people that don't know. Deists basically believe God is a kid with an ant hill. All right. right. He 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 reigns over the ant hill, but he's just observing it, monitoring it. Doesn't have his hands actually in it. Right. Right. Yeah. And he created it, created the world aeons ago like a clockmaker. He winds up the clock and then walks away. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but but the co- the consensus in America at the time of the war for independence was overwhelmingly Christian, just overwhelmingly Christian. And people like um, Jefferson, who had strains of free thinking in his thought, had to hide it in order to be elected to anything. Because Christians were, uh, because Americans were overwhelmingly Christian. And in 18, oh, this is one of my favorite topics. In 1892, there was a court case that came up to the Supreme Court, uh, deliciously named Holy Trinity versus the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> and in this court case, the Holy Trinity won. Um, uh, what happened was there was a church in New York in New York City that had called a British minister to be their minister, and they paid for his passage over um, to come take this job, this call at the church. Well, there was a law that Congress had passed against corporations paying the passage of numerous workmen to come work on a project and then releasing them into the country. And so there was a law in the books against that. And so some zealous prosecutor applied the law to the church who called a British minister. And uh, this case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Brewer um, decided, well, the Supreme Court decided the case in a common sense way. The decision is a very intelligent Look, the law is not talking about this situation. They settled that. Okay, Holy Trinity can call a British minister if they want. They can pay his passage over if they want. But then Brewer said, in his majority opinion, uh, while we're on this subject, let us remind everybody that the United States is a Christian nation. Hmm. And he and he reviewed the history of the of the country from the first settling, from before the nation existed as a nation. Fundamental orders of Connecticut. Uh, he go he walks. He through. went like Saint Stephen in the Book of Acts on him in, in right. his in his ruling, basically. Yeah, C- correct. He that's what he, he just walked through the whole thing, sounding very much like David Barton. And and so what he does is he. He just lays the case out and says, we are, in fact, a Christian nation. Now, this is 1892. This is, it is not the case that in 1893, we were living in a totalitarian hellhole with all the women having to wear red dresses and uh, uh, <laughs> carry on like the handmaid's tale. That, it wasn't that way at all. Not only that, but 1892 was not, was not, exactly ancient history. So I was born in 1953, and the distance between 1892 and 1953 is shorter than 
1953 and today. Your grandparents would have remembered that ruling, for example. Uh, y- yes. Yeah. And and so the um, the the thing to to uh, and my grandparents, my great grandparents, grew up in that America, and it was very much alive and is still very much alive in flyover country. Okay. Now it's th- there are. It's not like it's, everything's healthy in flyover country. It's not like a red county is a healthy place spiritually. There are there are many many things that we have to repent of and deal with and address many problems, but the the um, secularist assumption that is sort of pervasive in the urban deep blue areas, um, the deep blue areas of America are like. Uh, are like Europe are like Europe without castles, right? So um, it's just deeply secular. But that's not the case. That's not the case uh, in vast stretches of the American heartland. Now, what I'm wanting to do in in this book, Mere Christendom, is is remind American Christians that you don't need to be embarrassed. To talk about this, you you can you can articulate these things out loud. Mm-hmm. There's there is there's no reason um, a, an elected official can't say I'd like to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for this opportunity instead of everybody freaking out, setting their hair on fire. Mm-hmm. There's 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 nothing un-American about that. Hmm. How do we get there? I, you know, reading your book, and, and I mean, this is your calling card, it is brilliantly written and worded, but I, a lot of it I found to be an apologetic for this as a paradigm, okay? Mm-hmm. The, the question I want us to discuss, though, is how did, would such a paradigm be enacted? Okay, so here's the uh, good news, bad news. The, the <laughs> paradigm works. I think the paradigm makes sense. The paradigm fits with history. The paradigm fits with our history. So I think all of that is um, um, good. The challenge is we have slipped and fallen in lots of ways. And like you said, the pressing question is how do we get from where we are to back to this thing, overcoming the fierce opposition, much of that fierce opposition coming from fellow Christians? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I mean, look at what's happening uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention, just as as we are speaking right now. I mean, exactly. I mean, Uh, they can't even fire. They cannot even fire someone who is closer to cultural Marxist than what you're describing, because even the Southern Baptist Convention now is afraid of what the New York Times op ed page is going to say about them. I mean, you see, and you know this better than me as a pastor. You are in these circles even deeper than I am. You're right. We're, we're, yeah. We'd have to even convince our own people of this before we even dared take this out into the gen pop. Right. So um, one of the things you, you, people discover when they get involved in these things is there's no real way to start shooting at the devil and prevent him from shooting back. <laughs> right. um, I've noticed that um, actually doing this for the last 18 years. Yeah, I've taken a few shots. Yes, there, indeed. Yeah. There, there, there are people who want to restore America. They, it would be really nice if we could restore America to what it once was. If only we could do it to the polite background sound of golf applause. Mm-hmm. Right. Everybody's everybody thinks we're wonderful. And oh, look. They, the Christians rose up and restored a sense of decency. No, there, uh, there are people who are heavily invested in destroying a sense of decency. Mm-hmm. We're, this is a spiritual war. Okay, this is, this, is, uh, this is a spiritual war with some political repercussions as froth on the top of the raging sea. But the raging sea is a spiritual conflict. Okay, and that means that there's no real way of getting from where we are to where we need to be without reformation and revival. Mm -hmm. There has to there has to be a spiritual renewal among the people. Um, And that is a gift of God. We can't gin it up. We can't make it happen. We can't force God's hand. We can ask him. We can preach and declare and labor and do all these things. But 
ultimately, if God doesn't, if God does not show mercy mm-hmm. on our nation, we have had it. Or uh, stick a fork in it; it's done. I was invited a little more than a year ago at this time to an off-the-record meeting in Dallas where you and I are going to be speaking later this year at uh, prodigalamerica.com. And it was an off-the-record, so everybody could speak very freely, gathering of uh, ministers and Christian leaders who have been involved in the political realm for many, many years. And people that have been here since, like, the founding of the modern religious right, you know, in the Mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s. And, and, And for hours and hours, you know, everybody said, we need revival, we need revival, we need revival. And at the end, I mean, this was almost like Ben Franklin at the Constitutional Convention. A guy gets up that, had, that was the elder statesman had not said a word the entire day, Doug. And he gets up and he says, I keep hearing y'all talk all day long about we need revival. Do you understand what it is you are asking of God? Because we are way too comfortable to receive such a spirit in our current condition. That's how we allowed much of this to go on. We just abrogated our authority in the culture. Didn't, we didn't even lose. We just said, peace out. We just quit. Okay, and so, you know, it it just costs too much and we got other things to do and a purpose to find and a church growth plan to follow. We don't have time for this, he said. And so, you know, do you understand then if for for God to honor these prayers that you're giving, you are asking him to turn the heat up. Okay, to because that's what it would take to wake his people up to even respond to such a thing. And it just blew my mind when he said that at the end. And it has stuck with me for the last 14 months since I heard him say that. How would you respond as a pastor yourself? Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely correct. People tend to think of Reformation and revival as a glorious ticker tape parade. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, God, uh, all of a sudden, God does all these stupendous things. But. After the parade, who's going to clean up? Hmm. You know, what's people? If you if you go back to the Great Reformation of the uh, of the 16th century, um, 16th and 17th century, and look at that, it was an absolutely convulsive time. <laughs> it, we we look back on it, and we walk through the marbled halls of the museum. Yeah, we see the aftermath. And look at, yeah. And we look at the displays of of martyrs burning at the stake, and the picture is behind a velvet rope. And we and we say, "Oh, wasn't that glorious? And wasn't that glorious? And wasn't that glorious?" Well, at the time, we're, we're wearing masks from a plague that has a point zero three <laughs> infection fatality rate, and they're dealing with bubonic plague under the backdrop of everything you're just describing with a twenty five percent IFR at the same time. Yes. Right. And the Great Fire of London on yep. top of that. Yep. And, you know, so you've got uh, they they went through the meat grinder and 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 Jesus points to this. He says, um, you build the tombs of the prophets. Uh, there's something that people really like to do, and that is they like to honor the heroes of yore. But they would not tolerate for five minutes the behavior of any of those heroes of yore. <laughs> if if Patrick's if Patrick Henry showed up at your presbytery, if if Patrick Henry showed up at your city council meeting, what's this give me liberty or give me death business, right? We gotta be out of here in thirty five minutes. We got another service coming in. Exactly. That, yes. That's right. I mean, if you look at men like Samuel Adams or Patrick Henry or other angular personalities like that. Um, it's it, be, it begins to become apparent why we ask for revival and don't ever get it. It's because we don't really want it. In other words, we think that this is a um, it's a rescue, is, is essentially right. right. Okay, and this is that that it's the it's the happy ending. You know, we we all live happily ever after. It's not an instigator. It's the climax, right? That's kind of what you what, what we we view revival as, right? Correct. Yeah. So the great the when when Martin Luther when Europe was filled with fumes, and Martin Luther went into that room full of fumes and lit his. Uh, lit his match. He he didn't think that he was doing anything spectacular. He was going down to the the Wittenberg door was simply the bulletin board where mm-hmm. you posted things mm-hmm. and asking so for an posted, academic dispute. Yeah, yeah. He was posted the ninety five theses for a dispute. He put it up on the bulletin board. Um, 
Yeah, uh, hope to see you all at the community center. Refreshments <laughs> to follow. <laughs> and and then th- three weeks later, Europe is on fire. Yeah, you didn't think it was going to be the History Channel's second most important person of the millennium for doing that. No. That, that's right. It was just, so Europe goes up in the sheet of flame, and that's what we're asking for. That's that's what is needed. Um, there's there's no way to get through this time that we're in without more convulsion. Hmm. It, th- this is uh, this is a convulsive, decisive time, uh, and I'm I don't want to get distracted, but I, I do think that we're in the middle of a fourth turning right now. I, I I'm tracking with that book by uh, Howe and whatever the other guy's name was. Um, uh, where this is a this really is a period of of uh, severe convulsion. Uh, I don't think it's going to last forever, but it is going to be quite a rodeo. Hmm. And if if you are concerned, the late Francis Schaeffer used to talk about the Christian concern, the Christian compromise, where we're angling for personal peace and affluence, and we're saying, Lord, fix everything. But we're not going to risk our lives, our fortune, or our sacred honor. Like Augustine, Lord, give me, make me chase, but not yet. Essentially, yes, that's that's right. Yeah. Lord, or or the great cartoon I saw once, Lord, teach me patience and long suffering, and may I learn it all from books. <laughs> <laughs> right, or on the internet nowadays. All right, when we come back, Doug, I, there are two things I want you to address about how can we get to a mere Christendom. How much does theology, specifically eschatology, matter here? And then the, so the rise of the so-called dissident right, okay? And, mm-hmm. and many of them I agree with, but, but frankly, I don't understand much of what it is they think we're going to do. We're just going to expose, 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 expose. But at some point, we have to act, 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 act. Okay, and so I want to I want to get into that as well when we come back here with Doug Wilson. Uh, first, a word about our friends Cheers. over at Eden Pure and their outstanding thunderstorm air purifier. You can get the three pack right now for whole home protection for uh, two hundred dollars in savings, and you can't beat it. That's why they've had so many positive reviews on our show since they came on board a couple of years ago. Because it's not an air freshener; it's a purifier. It will go after the components that are causing the foul air in your home, whether that's some bacteria or a lot of bacteria, some viruses, whether that's cigarette smoke, dirty diapers, uh, the cooking, BO, whatever the case may be, it gets the job done. So you can get three units for $200 in savings, which means you get all three units now for under $200. You can't beat it at EdenPureDeals.com. Uh, to take advantage of this deal, use the discount code STEVE3. That's discount code STEVE3 to get the three pack from our friends at Eden Pure with their outstanding thunderstorm air purifier at EdenPureDeals.com. Eden, you know, the place we got kicked out of EdenPureDeals.com. Use the discount code Steve3. All right, more in a minute with, uh, in a few minutes with Douglas Wilson, Pastor Douglas Wilson, in his book, Mere Christendom. Stay tuned. So, folks, I've got a few events coming up here in Texas in the second half of the year. Uh, Next week, I'm going to be down in Dallas uh, with Liberty Pastors. Uh, I've got a couple of events down there. Uh, If you want to get more information, this is especially for pastors uh, that want to get trained on doing some of the work we were just discussing with uh, our guest this hour, Douglas Wilson. If that's you, uh, you want to be a part of this, I think there might still be a few slots open. LibertyPastors.com is where you can go for that. That's LibertyPastors.com. Before the election... Now, right before the election, uh, I'm going to be, I've mentioned this a couple of times already, but uh, Doug Wilson and I are both going to be speaking at an event called Prodigal America down in Dallas, uh, right around Halloween, I think that is. If you want to get more information on that event, you can go to prodigalamerica.com. That's prodigalamerica.com. And then, because they're likely still going to be counting votes until they get what they need. Did I say that out loud? Um, We're going to need to have to blow off some steam after this election month, year, okay? Festival. Festival. 
And so I'll be down there uh, again in Texas, again with our friends over at Patriot Academy. They've got a, a unique brand new firearms training program down there in Texas. Uh, and you can get firearms training, but also um, a constitutional defense course as well. I'll be down there with my good buddy, Daniel Horowitz. Uh, it's just outside of Fredericksburg, Texas. This is going to be, going to be the first time all three of us, uh, our Daniel, me, and Patriot Academy, have been able to do one of these things together. So if you'd like to attend so that you don't take your angst and frustration by the fact there are probably still going to be counting votes on November the 16th, um, you can take that into the holidays with you and can enjoy your family. All right. Come blow off some steam literally with us November 16th through the 18th. You can register right now at PatriotAcademy.com slash Steve. Again, register today at PatriotAcademy.com slash Steve. And with that, let's go back to our guest this hour, Douglas uh, Wilson, pastor from Moscow, Idaho, St. Andrews College. All right, this is our shorter segment, Doug. And so given how verbose you and I are, I think I've got time for two questions, okay? But I think they're both very important. Number one, uh, and this is a bit of a redux of how we open with instinctive versus intellectual, okay? But the dissident right, I view, is very intellectual, actually, and understands many of the broad themes at play here, the historical perspectives and the spiritual realities that we are describing. Um, And I have often found myself aligned with them until this primary when they all are pretty much aligned with Trump and I align with DeSantis. And and, and for me, the reason being is at some point we have to govern. I mean, I I understand we need to expose the evil. I I know we have to expose it, expose it. I expose it to a critical mass point. But then what is that critical mass point? No one really tells me what is the critical mass point. And then after the critical mass point, what are we going to actually do? And here I saw a guy in Florida that created his own critical mass point. I got elected. That's my critical mass point. Okay, that's the critical mass point. And then I'm going to do the stuff that people have just theorized about for decades. I'm going to actually do it and got rewarded in a state Obama won twice with the biggest gubernatorial win Florida's had since it became a member of the union. And so I, I what is the critical mass? Okay, they nearly shot Trump. That's, a, that, that is, that's exposed. They, they, they either covered it up or allowed it to happen. That's exposed. But at some point, we have to lead. We have to rule now in place of the system itself and that is that's the unanswered question i guess that's what would make them dissidents they're not even on the same page amongst themselves on that okay but what is the point now where we're like that's the critical mass we now have to take over the institutions we now have to actually govern and run a country here what is that point yeah there's a there's a hilarious uh, section i think it's in tacitus uh, talking about uh, in his history where he he describes a scene where the barbarians overran a Roman um, encampment and were trying to figure out how to operate a trebuchet, uh, one of their catapults or some some machinery of war. And it was, they conquered it, they, they took it, but they didn't know how to run it, <laughs> right? Um, when when Trump won in 2016, in the, the there's like four to five thousand political em, employees that submit their resignations that the president can appoint. When Hillary, uh, and then you have to submit lists of people that you want bef- before the election because they have to have a security clearance to work in the White House, and so Hillary submitted 1,600 names and was expecting to have a lot of Obama carryovers, right? So 1,600 plus a bunch of Obama workers. Uh, Trump, on the by that deadline, submitted 25 names uh, over against Hillary's 1,600. Hmm. And it illustrates a big problem that Trump had in his first administration of having to choose between competence and loyalty. Mm-hmm. Right. There were there were the loyalists to Trump and to Trump's project who didn't know how the job worked, who didn't know how the machinery operated. Right. For every Stephen Miller, we got an Omarosa, for example. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you had the people who were competent. They knew the office. They knew the structures. They knew the procedures. But they also knew how to how to submarine Trump's proposals, mm-hmm. but, you know, how, how to slow walk them and how to make them go away and that that sort of thing. Now, it's not as bad this time around. But the the same dynamic is is going on. Uh, there's a, there there's a twofold challenge. One is getting elected, and the other is governing. 
Okay, and the um, the the Trump the the dissident right might have uh, like you. I'm 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 on board with a bunch of that stuff, um, but I don't see a lot of commitment to the slow, painstaking work of actually governing, mm-hmm. which in, which includes uh, the right kind of compromise as opposed to the wrong kind of selling out compromise. Mm-hmm. Just, right? Uh, and so... Uh, you mean where you, you actually this, get something in return for giving something up for once. That's what you mean. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah correct. Um, now, the, the abolitionist, the, the abolitionism is this dissident right thing applied to the to the life issue, where um, the abolitionists are so impatient with having seen pro-lifers negotiate uh, from a position of weakness constantly mm-hmm. and and never getting anything substantive in return that finally they say forget it we're just gonna we're just gonna sh- shoot the moon okay um, and that has. It's appeal. There are times when you want to man the barricades. <laughs> there are times you want to say war with the world. But there are also times when, on reflection, we we still have to do something responsible if we win the election. Okay. Now I'm um, ba- basically I'm where you are. I I would like the dissident right to accept the the judicious input of older veterans who are not necessarily compromised simply because they say steady cowboy, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, someone's going to wield power here on this mortal coil. Someone is, right. okay? And so the, the, the goal should be, I mean, ultimately, to me, um, it's uh, exposing for exposing, uh, you know, K- sake doesn't it doesn't change the power dynamic at all. I mean, the, the power dynamic has to change when if, if we're exposing in order for now believers to now. OK, you know, for the righteous to rule so the people will rejoice, as the proverb says. OK, right. Uh, if, we're, if we're doing it for that end, then I'm then, you know, I'll sit here and expose till the day is long. But if we're just at some point, that pivot needs to be made. And I think that movement, which I think is, again, vitally necessary to counter to counteract the rigor mortis that is set in on too much of the right, as we discussed at the top of this, needs to also, though, figure out what is its price point to now we have to actually govern this place. We got to run this place. And what is that? Um, right. The other thing I wanted to ask you about here, and I've got about six minutes for you to tackle a, a 600-year okay. argument, okay? <laughs> um, okay. How much is, does eschatology play in to this conversation? I mean, if, if, if you are a firm believer, and, and I'll, I'll just in the interest of full disclosure, Doug, my official eschatology is confusion, because I've studied all y'all's talks mm. and what you all say about each other, and I'm just wholeheartedly confused, because I find all your arguments against each other very compelling, okay? Yes. <laughs> so I'm not sure what I agree, what I believe in the affirmative, okay? Um, yep. this, I'm not a dissident. I don't know how to act, okay? I, I believe too much, I know too much, and now I don't know what to do, okay? But it does the seem... The millennium, this will set you straight. The millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. Yeah, yes. <laughs> now I feel better instantly. Yes. But ultimately, right. if, if I believe that things get worse no matter what, okay, you know, in other words, in, and I've been frustrated with, with my being involved in evangelical politics for almost 20 years, this idea of driving the car with the gas and the brake at the same time, all right, that things get worse no matter what I do, but yet they're the first people that often run into the battle at the same time. Can I, can uh-huh. I, do I have a mere Christendom plan if I'm, if I think that this might actually be the terminal generation that we are in? Uh, yes. I'll, I, let me say something in, uh, uh, praiseworthy about both perspectives um, or the there's something admirable about the the Christians who think we're down here to lose you know we lose down here um, and they basically are Christian advocates they they're, they're Christians marching into the Battle of Ragnarok um, it's the end of the world the the monsters defeat the gods and ultimate defeat is no um, refutation. So it's it's sort of it's a cosmic Alamo where we go down, we go down fighting. It's a great tale of heroism, but we lose. Okay, there really is something admirable about the the man who goes into battle 
knowing he's going to lose, but it's, he's going to take a stand for the right anyway. It's very, right? well, frankly, Christ-like. He goes, he goes to the cross knowing he's going to be tortured and die there. Yes. Right. At the same time, running around p- to push the other direction, uh, for those who have played sports, you know what it's like to play a team that has given up already before they take the field. They frequently don't fight well. Mm -hmm. They don't play well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or they give up uh, playing the other team, and they start fighting each other. Right. Uh, I have some uh, experience with this, Doug. In fact, way too much. Go ahead. Yes. Right. Uh, And so that that defeatist, I think a defeatist eschatology creates the temptation for most to to become apathetic, to start uh, majoring on minors, to fight with uh, fellow troops. That a discouraged army is not a, an effective fighting force. Although you're going to have some people in there who are the admirable Ragnarok warriors. Um, can I, I quick? Can I, I quickly I, say though? Having again, I've organized. I've been involved in lots of efforts to organize evangelicals. And mm-hmm. I completely agree with your, I've seen this so many, what you just described, so many with premillennial people. I've, I've been equally frustrated on the opposite side for postmillennial people who seemingly think they win in history, but like no one's ever good enough to support. Okay. I, I, that one I don't understand either. We win everything, but no one is good enough. So I'm just going to sit here and pontificate. I've, I've run into that a million times too, Doug, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Yeah, me too. And um, but one of the things I would point to is, um, and this is all the grace of God. But here in Moscow, we have a post-millennial community that is that is building brick by brick, that is more than happy to support imperfect efforts in the right direction. Um, we are. Uh, I I call myself a. I'm I'm a conservative right wing incrementalist. So everybody knows when, and this is how the left has done so well. When they when they come into Idaho and they ask for a million acres to be set aside as wilderness area, everybody and his dog knows that they're going to be back next year demanding more. That's how they work. They don't give up. They're they're tenacious, and that tenacity is something that. Uh, Christian conservatives have to acquire. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe that postmillennialism gives us the room to function that way. It also, people being people, uh, every, I'm, I'm fond of saying that whenever you enroll in a math class, the first thing you encounter is math problems. So if you become post-mill, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to encounter post-mill problems, post-mill temptations. Oh, it's all going to work out so we don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. The, the, the movie ends happily, so I don't have to do my part. Um, well, the problem is, yeah, the movie ends happily, but you're what character are you in it? You're the wastrel skunk who didn't do his part. <laughs> so, so. That seems like a great place to end it right there, actually, Doug, as we are short on time, brother. It has been uh, a pleasure, and uh, we will not wait a few more years uh, before we do this again. And um, uh, we've got a, we're almost done with the show. We're going to stick around afterwards and do an overtime, and we're going to talk about you behind your back for about 15, 20 minutes. I hope you're okay, okay. with that. I'm, I'm absolutely okay with that. And I'll see, you in, I'll see you in the fall. You bet. Thank you. That's Douglas Wilson. You can get his book, Mere Christendom. All right. Two-minute warning. You each want to give us a preview here for subscribers. Yeah, I'll give each of you a minute on uh, what you think we need to flesh out more as a result of this conversation with Doug coming up here in the overtime that we're going to record for the subscribers. So I, I consider myself still pre-mill. And it should say something about Douglas that he is more charitable uh, in his words, <laughs> to that eschatology that I am sometimes, even though I hold it myself. And that's kind of going to be, I, I've had some changes in thinking a little bit about that, that I'll, I'll talk about um, in, in the overtime as well. But these are important conversations to have. We cannot not have conversations uh, like this. We have to start thinking towards the future not just reacting all the time. There are good things that are happening. There, this, is, this is where I, I've got to have my head on a swivel, and every, everybody has to have their heads on swivels. 
there are positive things that are happening. You just look at what COVID did. I bring this example up a lot. It woke up a lot of people to what are being yeah. taught, what's being taught in the schools in a place that that we weren't at 20 years ago. Did we get school choice so fast without COVID? Probably. Probably not. Probably not. So, yeah. it, there are. There are positive things that are happening, but yet it always constantly feels like we're on the precipice. And so we've got to be nimble, got to have our heads on a swivel. And I think having these conversations about the road ahead and how to how to actually equip ourselves, how to have the tenacity that he's just talking about towards the end, though, and um, of that conversation. These are things that we really need to be awakening to. Todd? I just love never having read him before that. I mean, he has a certain style of uh, writing, clearly very funny, but I thought, maybe, you know, maybe it's just a bit. No, that's just that guy. I mean, when he goes, I remember a hilarious portion of Tacitus. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I don't think that's we've ever had yeah. a sentence on this show no. uttered that started out like that. Yes. I like uh, which, which as opposed to that other hilarious portion of Tacitus. Yes. That we often gets confused by. Yes. And the reason that it's important, it's not a bit. It's like it's a very... There's, he has a very human, and, and I mean in, in the best possible sense, of, of, of approaching things. He's trying to connect with other people yeah. because his goal is to change real people's lives. It's not, Steve, you always talk about, uh, you know, at the end, are you going to submit your your theological treatise when you get to the gates of St. Peter? No, mm-hmm. this is ultimately about souls, mm-hmm. flesh and blood humans. We do have some breaking news. Should not be breaking news. Joe Biden has been seen in public. He's alive. He is alive. Five, almost six full days we went without seeing the president of the United States. All right, we're going to stick around. Do that overtime. We teased uh, for Doug and for you. For the rest of you, see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 828.